first of all, I would like to thank um, the organization for having me here. Um, it's such an honor to be able to speak among such a, some of the heavy hitters in the industry. Um, and I think today the topic that I really want to talk about is um, designing versatile and flexible spaces and objects in, uh, in today's transient lifestyle. Um, but um, along the way, I really kind of want to impart my experience and um, some of my knowledge to, I think, the fellow young designers. Um, I think amongst the speakers today, I feel like I am probably most similar to your age, and I kind of, um, I, I kind of share what you've go you're going through right now, um, because not too many years ago, I was in the exact same position as you. Um, you know, about to graduate and not really knowing what I want to do with my career. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to talk about how, you know, I'm here today and the journey of Lim and Lou. Um, so Lim and Lou's uh, a design, a multidisciplinary design firm that my wife and I started. She's a Lou and I'm the Lim. Um, and together, you know, we focus on interiors, um, products, and furniture. And I think that's something that, um, you know, that I didn't know that I could do before graduating. You know, I studied um, at Cornell University. I studied architecture. And, you know, all throughout my education, I thought, I'm going to graduate and I'm going to become an architect, you know. Um, and it was always kind of a, a narrow mind frame that I'm going to become an architect and I've always wanted to become an architect. But I think, um, you know, the more you get exposed to different types and aspects of design, you really really find your true calling and what that really is. Um, so I'll start at the beginning of the journey and um, how we started. But so the preface to starting Lim and Lou was it really started off as a hobby. Um, while I was working um, at an architecture firm in New York, um, I, my wife and I felt quite, um, we we're kind of in a rut. You know, every day in an architecture office, you're kind of doing the same thing. You're drawing window details, curtain wall details, you know, stone tiling patterns, all that stuff. And sometimes it could really get quite mundane. From project to project, you're really doing the same thing. So we really wanted to create, uh, we wanted to have our creative outlet for ourselves. So we started designing furniture as a hobby. Um, and I think this is something that's quite important, um, which I didn't know, you know, um, entering the professional workforce. I never learned patience, you know. It's something that you, you know, I, I think um, Nick Nicholas was saying, you know, he's he's been working on a project for 30 years and he's still working on it. So architecture is quite a tedious and kind of, um, it really tests your patience. And so that's why we created um, furniture pieces for ourselves as a way to, um, you know, showcase our design abilities. And from there, it kind of became its own thing. So now I'll start, you know, with that kind of, longer introduction than I would like. Um, I'll talk about the pieces that we talked about. Um, so the design process for us, how it normally works is, um, you know, as I think creative beings and creative creatures, you're constantly looking for inspiration. Um, and for me, um, how I find inspiration is just really keeping your eyes open and looking around you. Um, because I think inspiration is really everywhere. And me growing up in Hong Kong, born and bred, the bamboo scaffolding is something that really resonated with me um, and throughout my life. And I think as, as designers, you know, um, I, I wouldn't say there's good design or bad design. It's, it's just design, and there's, it's design subjective. Um, and so I think it's important to offer up a new perspective. And so my contribution to it was I was looking at the scaffold, and I was thinking, how could this be turned into a form of design? Um, and so we created our first piece, which we exhibited in the furniture fair, which was the frame table. And basically, the construct of the table itself mimics the scaffold itself. Um, and it's really just acts as an armature for all these pieces to go on. So we like to say that this is a piece that's designed by us, but personalized by you. And you'll see that as a recurring theme in our design. And it's really something that we design, but Without the human aspect of it, it really doesn't come to life, you know. Um, it's just an ordinary table. But with pieces like this that we've designed, and once you interact with it, it becomes something special and something that's quite unique to just you. 
because you would have the same coffee table and I would have the same coffee table and it would be used very differently. Um, another thing we looked at were these lily pads that's floating on still water and you know just looking at these things the thought was how could this be turned into another furniture piece um, and you know we we're just thinking maybe these are actually pedestals for you to display display individual objects that float up, that um, that you can you know have in your coffee uh, in your living room and I think part of the thing is you know how because we're all individuals and we all have different needs, um, you might use a coffee table very differently than me. You know, if you don't have anything on it, you could really have one lily pad displaying your favorite coffee table book or something like that. Um, and the third piece is the nest stool. That, um, so these three pieces were the first collection that we actually designed while we're still at our full-time jobs um, as a creative, uh, as a means to have a creative outlet. And this is a nest stool, and I think it's really inspired by kind of growing up in these tiny, tiny apartments in Hong Kong and New York, very densely populated cities. Um, and it's really a stool that has a drawer underneath um, that can be stacked to create a storage unit, or when you have guests over, you could pull them off and it becomes stools on its own. Um, so that was the first three pieces. And after the first three pieces, we decided um, we could probably do this um, professionally. So my wife and I moved back to Hong Kong and we um, started our own design practice. And the first project that we actually took on was our own home. Um, this was our own home. And you know, we were kind of thinking, how could we um, trans, how do we do the interior up where it's not like your typical Hong Kong apartment. You know, um, typical Hong Kong apartments have all these compartments in it and they're all individual rooms. So our thinking was how could we break, a, break it up and really open up the space? So we started utilizing these sliding doors um, that could really turn the apartment into one, f one fluid space, really. Um, and so, and another thing that we like to utilize is really color. I think, you know, while studying architecture, everything's always black and white and in monotone. And that's something they teach you in school, right? It's like to dress in all black. Um, but it, the reality is that life is actually full of color, right? You look around you and it's filled with color. And that's where I think interiors have the opportunity to do the same thing, right? I think Cameron can attest to something like that. It's, you know, it's, it's exciting, right? Um, and so what we did with the apartment was, in the spaces where you'd like to relax, such as the bedroom and living room, um, the colors are quite um, muted. You know, we're using wood and white walls. But in the spaces where we think should inject some energy, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, in the bathroom maybe, that's where you might, might want that pop of energy. So in the, three, in the three spaces that we think are spin-off spaces from your primary living spaces would be your bathroom, your walk-in closet, and you know, a study. Um, and again, we utilize all these sliding doors to m really make a small space feel much larger. Um, and with the glass, it really allows the light to penetrate further deeper into the space. Um, and so on the right you see is our walk-in closet. And this is really my wife's domain. Um, she worked at Tiffany's Interiors and is really her domain. Um, she loves the closet and she, her thinking was if nowadays you see a lot of residential influences in, um, in, in retail stores, why can't it be the other way around? I think again, it's really offering a new perspective. So now whenever sh we go into our closet every day, it feels like we're shopping for that day's clothing. Um, and on the left is our, um, our, our study, which also utilizes these sliding doors. Um, and in my, the first image of it, it's completely closed and there's curtains behind it which could be drawn. And sometimes it acts as an extra guest bedroom for us. Um, and when it's, you know, when there are no guests, it really opens up and becomes an extension of the living room. So I think that's something that we like to stress in our design. It's creating spaces that are flexible and adaptable for you know, today's changing lifestyle, I think.
And with this, with our own residential project, what we actually did was we thought it was quite special to also be able to design some of the furniture pieces um, in it. And this is the, the seating series that we did. And um, most of the furniture we actually designed, except for some lighting pieces and some chairs. Um, and I think, you know, being taught in architecture school, you know, a chair is always something that you also want to design. You know, it's, I think there's, an, uh, there's a reading where it's an architect, you know, you first need a name, you need a chair, and I think you need a building, right? Um, so those are the three things, and we haven't quite mastered the chair yet, so we're easing into it through a sofa series. Um, but so with this, again, it's how does it become, you know, with just an ordinary sofa piece, how could it become flexible and adaptable? Um, and so, you know, the, the idea behind it is really carving a gold block out and replacing it with cushions. And with different size cushions, we're able to kind of play with the adaptability with it. And the running joke is, you know, when my wife and I aren't fighting, this is the sofa we have at home. And when we fight, I get that small piece on the left, and she gets the piece on the right. Um, so, you know, just little kind of, little um, details here and there really completes a piece, I think. Um, and this is the three series together. And I think this is actually a part where I think um, this is part of um, something that I want to share with you, young designers. Um, it's, I think as designers, you like to plan everything. You like to have everything, um, you know, to plan, like, you know, this is going to be my career path. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and then 10 years down the road, I'm going to be here. But I think in reality, it's a little, it's quite messy. You never really get, you know, it's, it's, never, it's, not, it's never as you planned it. And same with this sofa series, actually. Now we're working with a Danish brand on this sofa series, but it was, that, that was never our plan in the beginning. Um, they just picked it up after seeing our apartment being published. So I think, you know, always just be passionate about what you do and do it with with love and passion, and I think it'll always work out, you know, one way or another. Um, and so, you know, moving on, so these are some of the inspirations. Um, we look to a lot of nature for our inspiration and how that becomes, whether it's furniture or spaces. Um, so this is a lunar mirror, um, and it's a mirror that we designed for our own home again. Um, and it's a mirror that has a 180 degree hinge, and it has mirrors on both sides. So when my wife is trying to get something from her side of the vanity, I could still use my side as a mirror. Um, and if you're quite neat like my wife, you could keep it open on her side. And on my side, it's always closed. Um, and another thing about um, our design process, or, or, or our design, yeah, our design process is that I think with architecture school and design school, it's you never really arrive at a destination, right? It's just tomorrow's your, your day for crits and that's it. You know, you're always working till, um, you know, the, the last hour, the last minute even. And that's very similar to our practice, actually. We never actually think that we've arrived at a final solution, I think. Um, so again, you know, uh, when we first started, what you see is the product on the left. And as we constantly do explorations with different materials and different finishing, um, you know, we modified the size. We use metal legs instead of wood, so it feels a lot lighter. Um, and maybe we change the top to marble. But you know, I'm not saying either one is better. I think it's just depending on the scenario and the situation, which one you'd use. Um, so again, I don't think there's ever wrong solution in design. Again, you know, this is more like a De Stiel style uh, inspiration of the same table. And this image, I think, I normally put up here to um, illustrate how my wife and I work together. Um, you know, I'm quite heavy and she's quite light. Um, and, you know, I think it's with that kind of contrast um, does it yield really interesting results because I think, and that's, that's where I think, um, you know, Cameron's 
point of collaboration is extremely important. I think I personally feel the hardest projects are always self-initiated ones because you don't have a client and you don't really have a critic to judge your work. Um, so it's always hardest to start with a blank canvas. So the collaborative effort actually helps move um, the project along and also allows you to achieve a better result because of the constant challenges that you might get from your collaborators. Um, and so this is a restaurant we did after our home. Um, and it really, another thing we really like to do is we like to design with context in mind. I think it's really important as a designer from Hong Kong, we like to look at elements that are local. And for us, the, neons, the neon light is extremely significant. And the, the well, if you go to the wet market, you see these red glowing hanging pendants. And that was extremely, um, significant to us as well. Um, but what was kind of interesting about this project was the color scheme was dictated after because we looked at Cha Tan Tang as a reference, which is, you know, these local diners that serve um, comfort food. And in, in Cha Tan Tang, you get these tiles, these mosaic tiles that are very, that's very kind of, it's iconic almost to the Hong Kong dining scene. And they only come in very specific colors. And it actually came in pink and green. And so that was what set the palette of um, the entire restaurant. So we didn't go into the, the design thinking, oh, it's going to be green and pink. But we actually went with a material as kind of the determining factor. And I think that's kind of another interesting thing about design, it's, you know, there is, there's no one way to do certain things. I think keep an open mind and, you know, the solution will find itself if you, you know, if you let it. Um, and also because this restaurant is, um, it's meant to be a takeout diner or, uh, you know, a grab and go place, we thought, what if we um, opened up the, the doors completely so it really becomes an extension of the street for people to come in and out. Um, and so luckily we had, you know, a second floor upstairs and we thought this, what if this became the new street um, facade really? So it's like you're inside, but at the same time you're outside. Um, and so um, also because the restaurant is a, uh, it's a fusion Cantonese restaurant, we thought how could we translate the menu into the interiors itself? And it's really using um, very local materials, contrasting it with, you know, some Western materials such as marbles and like the colors um, to create this uh, menu into the interiors, really. Um, so some of these uh, residential projects I will um, really kind of uh, blow through quite quickly, but I think, you know, as a, I think the scale that we work in is significantly smaller um, than I think. I think. I think Keat was saying, you know, the different scales like XL, L, medium, small. I think we we're probably in like the extra small category, and I think that's something that, you know, as as designers and architects, I think, you know, pra practicing patience is also extremely important because I think, you know, we all want to do buildings. We all want to have, you know, a landmark somewhere. But I think, you know, it's always a stepping stone. And, you know, I don't think, I don't think scale really matters in terms of how good the design is. Um, and I think sometimes even when the smaller it is, the more detail you need to look at and the better result it actually is. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, for us, we started with residentials and we're still doing a lot of residentials. Um, and now we're slowly pivoting into hospitality and F&B work. Um, but this, so this, res, this, this res residence is um, really kind of uh, an apartment that's layered. You know, when you first enter the, you get the image on the left. Um, it's just a, a vestibule, entry vestibule. But when you slide the door back, what you're exposed to is a, an artist workshop. And when you slide that door back, you're exposed into um, the apartment itself. And another thing is, um, I think what's really important is for young designers to photograph their work and photograph it well. 
um, because this is your calling card, right? Um, without it, you, I mean, I think when you're first starting out, you're trying to build a portfolio, and this is your calling card. And so for us, a trick is to involve pets if you can. Because pets always sell, in my opinion. People love animals. So you'll see that as a reoccurring theme, right? <laughs> if you want a photo to go viral, include some animals. And another thing we really like to do is, you know, play with color, especially with, you know, Hong Kong, they're extremely small apartments. You know, this is a 400 square feet apartment. Um, and so, and, and a lot of times it's, it might be a rental unit, you know, because um, I think property prices are quite expensive in Hong Kong. And so the client really wanted something that's quite special, um, but with limited space and limited budget, you know, I think color becomes another material that could really do a lot of impact. Um, so again, it's a small quaint flat, flat, but we end up using a lot of different colors to really give it that energy and pop. Um, and I think it's also great to have as Nippon as the organizers because we'll be using a lot of <laughs> the Nippon paint in our projects, really. Um, and so this is another project. Again, reoccurring theme seems to be color. Um, and so this is our take on a, resident, uh, on, a, on a retail store. So this is a store that sells sanitary goods. And I don't know about Singapore, but in Hong Kong, when you shop for sanitary wear, it's kind of toilets and toilets and toilets and sinks and sinks and sinks. And then when you bring the client there, it's like they never understand, like, what's the difference between sink A and sink B, because they all look the same, right? It's like sardine cans packed in, in you know, in a store, basically. Um, so our take was to rethink the retail experience and create different vignettes and different experiences so you have different styles. Um, so when you're in the store, you actually could envision how this might look in my home, you know, if you're crazy enough to do this blue tile with, you know, with this wainscot. This could be your bathroom. Or if you liked pink and green, which is something we really like, it seems. Um, so it's really providing all these different vignettes for people to, you know, to shop for, I think. Um, and this is a recently completed project, and again, it's, the, the client, I think, um, I think Cameron was saying um, chemistry, right, is significantly important. And I think that's true when you are first starting out. Um, there's, I think opportunity cost is real, you know. With a small practice, if you take on one project, it's very hard for you to take on another project. And so I think you really need to, and, and, and it's not easy to gauge whether you have the right chemistry with the client or not. Um, you know, it's really, you're jumping into the same ship with them and, you know, it might be for the next three to six months and it could end up being a really bad project or a really good project. Um, and, you know, this, this client we thought was, you know, it's maybe not our typical style. And again, I think being a young practice, we might not actually have a typical style yet and we're still trying to find our voice. And I think that's okay, you know. Um, nobody's telling you you have to commit to a single style right now. Um, and I think the more you do it, the longer you do it, you'll start to find your voice and what your real style is. Um, again, what's the first thing you see? <laughs> it's a dog. <laughs> um, so again, try to use dogs, use pets um, to try sell your work because it does work, right? I think part of being a successful designer is a being able to sell your work, right? And it's, you know, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, and the client here really wanted a home that um, feels like they've been away from the city, removed from the city, and they're actually in Bali or Phuket for a vacation. And so a lot of the materials we use were quite natural. We use rattan, wood, slate, um, wood slats to give it that kind of feel that you're not in your typical Hong Kong apartment. Um, Um, 
And so this is a, a furniture series that's quite significant to my wife and I because we both went to Cornell University. And this is really our way of giving back. Um, and again, when you're a small firm, a lot of the models in your photo is actually yourself. You know. <laughs> um, but this, you know, this is for Cornell University's New York studio. And, um, and it's, they wanted it for their space that's actually quite flexible. They have all these moving panels that could be reconfigured for pinups, for meetings, for crits. Um, and they wanted a furniture series that also reflected that flexibility and adaptability to it. And so we we're thinking, what's extremely unique to New York? And we thought it would be these push carts. These push carts are everywhere in New York, and it's used to transport goods from point A to point B. And it also has two lifestyles, or two lives to it. One when it's lying flat, and one when it's standing up. So we thought the furniture could also have that characteristic of it. So if you look at the, the, the lectern or the podium, it stands up, and when it's down, it becomes a coffee table. Um, and it could be a sofa when it's down. When it comes up, it becomes a coat rack. Um, again, models. <laughs> So if this doesn't work out, if anybody's looking for a model. <laughs> Is that your wife? <laughs> yeah, that's my wife. <laughs> the better looking half. <laughs> um, so yeah, so when it's down, it's a sofa. When it's up, it acts as a coat rack. And these are some on-site photos um, of how it actually used in the space. And also, because space is quite limited, um, you know, these pieces could all be lined up in a row, and it becomes quite space saving. Um, and you know, this photo, I think, is, is quite telling of what it actually looks like. Um, and so we also venture into you know, smaller scale objects, which you know, if you told me I was going to do objects um, when I was going through architecture school, or just when I graduated, I'd say, you're out of your mind. Like, I'd no, I wouldn't go into products. But I think. When you work in different scales, um, you're exposed to a lot of different things as well. You see things very differently. I think if you look at the same scale all the time, it starts becoming quite mundane, I think. Um, so it's always nice to you know, jump between scales. Um, and this is, and again, even with smaller scale objects, we look at how things could be flexible and adapt and become a larger system. Um, so this is the wave candelabra. Um, and with one, this is how it looks. But with two, you could interlock it, and then it becomes um, you know, a candle holder for five. And then you could continue linking them up until you have really infinite. Um, and so you know, again, we looked at you know, everyday objects, common objects that you might find. And for me, as a kid, this is something that I used to play with all the time. And we're thinking, how could that be translated into an object? So we thought it could be a vase. It's really just a large cylinder with a huge um, circular plate on its waist. And it offers, you know, when it's standing up, it just acts as a regular vase. But when you tip it on a side, um, you know, it offers a new perspective to looking at the flowers. You know, oftentimes we have this and we're like rotating it around in our home. And it's quite interesting to see flowers in a different point of view. Um, this is the split vase, and the inspiration behind it is, behind it is looking at these traditional Ming vases that has become quite iconic. Um, and it's almost like uh, you know everybody who goes to ch China might bring this back home and be like, oh, I've been to China. Um, but we were also thinking, you know, the 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 um, exquisite corpse which was a, a game that you know, a lot of children played. You fold a piece of paper, and you make indications on the piece of paper. And one person would draw one thing and pass it on. And you would just link up where um, the markers are. And then at the end, what you come up with and what you get is actually something that's quite unique and quite um, fascinating. And so we thought, how could we do that with our vases, right, or our vase design? And so we took different shapes of um, the traditional Ming vases, and we casted them half, and we casted it with another half to create something that's quite unique, um, something that's quite unusual, but yet it's quite familiar because you've seen these shapes before. Um, 
And this is something that was really a, a on-site design. You know, we were in Jingdezhen, which is the porcelain capital of China or even of the world. Um, and we bought some of these plates and, you know, accidentally we were just stacking them up and we we're like, hey, what if this was a vase? So I think it's just being open to opportunities when it presents yourself um, and seeing design in a different light. Um, and I think this will be the last project that I'll talk about. Um, and it's a carpet series for Taiping. And again, earlier when I was talking about how um, opportunity presents itself um, and you can't always plan your career path. This is one of the instances. Um, I think after we were awarded the Maison en Objet Rising Asian Talent, um, you know, we thought that would be a great opportunity to collaborate with a homegrown Hong Kong brand. And because of that, we were able to collaborate with Taiping Carpets. They were very open to the idea where, how can we showcase Hong Kong design with a young talent and an old brand? And so this isn't their typical project that you'd normally see. Um, and the, I think what's the, the most interesting of, about this, this project is, um, aside from the colors and textures, they're built in modules, basically. So it's a modulated carpet system that allows you to um, configure it in different ways depending on the size and the shape of your room. Um, and I think that is the last slide. Great, thank you.